Minister, thank you for, for talking to us. You, you've just had a, I guess it's kind of a promotion. Your department just got a lot bigger. Yes, many more responsibilities uh, because I'm picking up the business facing aspects of the former uh, Bayes department. And we'll talk about that in a second, but, but for the time being, we're here in Italy. You've announced a partnership, I think it's called. What difference in practice will that make? Because a lot of people might look at that and say, you know, it's not changing tariffs, it's not changing custom rules, it's not changing any of the kind of big substantive stuff. So it kind of counts for basically nothing, does it? Um, it does count for something. One of my uh, top five priorities, in fact, my top priority is reducing market access barriers. And what this kind of partnership allows is a framework to problem solve. So no, we're not changing taxes or regulations, but quite a lot of the problems that business brings to me, uh, certainly from the international trade perspective, is the differences in terms of how people do business, customs issues and so on, that are not necessarily written in text or in legislation, but are still creating barriers which we can bring down. And they are on both sides. So in the same way that we have issues doing business uh, with Italy, Italians also have some issues dealing with the UK. So this is a framework for us to solve those problems perhaps on a case-by-case -case basis, but perhaps sectorally, it depends on what the issue is. Talk, talking to some of the chief executives, one of the things they keep saying is there are barriers, and there are barriers, a lot of them are self-imposed because of Brexit, and things have got worse for them in terms of trade. That's, that's kind of a fair assessment, isn't it? Some of them are, some of them are. With any change, you will have pluses and minuses. And when we left uh, the European Union, we wanted to have an independent trading policy that has brought a lot of benefits in terms of things that I can do now with the WTO. We have a, an independent seat there. I'm able to reduce a lot of market access barriers faster and more quickly than I would have been able to, uh, or rather we as a country would have been able to if we'd been in the EU. But yes, there are new barriers that have come up. Many of them are not actually in the text of the agreement. It's about uh, now having to figure out how different countries interpret the rules and make sure that they do so in a way which helps our businesses uh, trade with them and their businesses trade with us. Because, I mean, you know, how do you react when you hear, and it's, we hear it a lot more and we see it in the polling, people getting really frustrated, a sense of regret. Um, Brexit isn't going very well, is it? Well, I think this is, one of the, this is one of the reasons why I'm here. We spent so much time having an argument about whether we should have left or stayed in. That took up many years, you know, an entire parliament in one case. But we haven't actually spent enough time talking about what we can do with having an independence trade policy. So I'm not surprised a lot of people are feeling regret because there are many other sort of economic background factors, nothing to do with Brexit, which make the which can make people feel bleak. What I'm trying to say but is they're getting it wrong. It's not a, actually a lot Brexit. Of, is, uh, no, no, that's not what I've said. What I've said is that it is one factor. There are some advantages, there are some disadvantages. What I'm here to do is look at where new barriers have come up because we've left and try and remove them. This is what having an independent trading policy looks like. This is what happened when we were in the EU. Uh, it's just that we didn't do it ourselves. It was done at EU commission level. Now we do it ourselves and we need to make sure that we can reduce those barriers. But also remember that the EU is one trading partner. America, the USA is our biggest individual trading partner. I do a lot of market access barrier removal work there, as well as with the West, rest of the world. And also, I'm able to do things like uh, sign trade negotiations, which I'm working on with India, and also with the many countries in the uh, CPTPP. We're, we're here in Italy, though, and you know, how would you say Italian trade with Italy has gone over the last few years? Would you say since Brexit it's, it's up, or would you say it's gone down? Um, I, uh, un as I understand it, it has gone up, certainly in, uh, in today's figures. We are trading more overall it with the it's EU. It's gone down. It's, um, the figures that I have are that we have 330 billion uh, in terms of UK, uh, EU trade. That is something that has gone up. But certainly with, the with figures Italy, too. It's gone, with Italy, it's kind of down by about 12% or 16% well, it, it also, it's, what it's, it's, you're looking it, at. It, it, exactly. It depends on what, you, what you're looking at. Are but, you looking at trade by... it's always down. I need to finish, the, need to finish um, the sentence. Depends on whether you're looking at it by volume. It depends on whether you're looking at it by value. It also depends on which inflation figures you are applying. And as we have said, trade with the EU is impacted by many things, not just Brexit. Pandemic, it's been impacted by labour market issues across the continent, not just in the UK. It's been impacted by the war in uh, UK, Russia, gas prices. There's so much 
that is creating a more difficult trading environment. So my job is to make sure that we are working in order to make things better. What I can't do is get in a time machine and go back into the EU. And what I find frustrating is that we spend loads of time, loads of time trying to relitigate Brexit rather than focus on solving new issues that are coming up. That's what I'm here to do. I'm not here to go back to 2017, 2019 and do that. We wasted so much time and I'm not here to waste time. I'm here to fix problems for business. Having a long discussion around, oh, but it was better with this year and not that year and it's gone up and it's gone down. It is the long-term trend that I need to work towards rather than what happened this year, last year. I, I think that that is actually, it's, it's what I would call a fake conversation. It's like asking people who just got married, where's the baby, where's the baby? Some things will take time and some things uh, will happen quickly. We lost a lot of time during the pandemic. We lost a lot of time with squabbling. Now we have a new government that is actually focusing on delivering for the British people. And the Prime Minister had the five priorities, which you know, the second is growing the economy. Mm -hmm. He has now created an economic growth department by merging uh, business with trade. And I'm here to deliver on that. And that's really interesting. So you see your department, you talked in your leadership bid mm -hmm. about cutting, you know, kind of having the treasury and then having an economic growth department. Mm. So that's what you view your current, your new role as yes, being. Yes, very much It's so. the Department for Economic Growth, ultimately. Yes. yes. It's really interesting because that's, you know, that it, 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 it's kind of a slightly different kind of version of changing Whitehall than the version I think you were talking about, which was that the Treasury had become too powerful. Well, no, it wasn't. Uh, the point I was making wasn't that the Treasury had become too powerful. But it was, it was a wider argument about how much the state does. The Treasury is so focused on all of the other macro stuff that the economic growth uh, bit of it, uh, which was what I was a minister for, remember I was the Exchequer Secretary in the Treasury, uh, just seemed to always be the Cinderella in the, in the department. And I thought, well, it'd be probably better if somebody else was just doing this separately. It wasn't so much about breaking up the Treasury, but making the focus of economic growth another unit's priority. And I think by bringing uh, DIT and Bayes as they were into one department, it's now very clear who is doing that. Part of the difficulty, though, is that you're not setting taxes in the same way, you know, the Treasury seem, really keeps control yep. of that. And do you think at the moment that we have the right kind of balance of taxes and spending in this country to try and achieve that growth? Uh, in terms of what is feasible to do now, yes. I think... Uh, it's very easy to make cases for cutting taxes all the time. It all depends on which side of the Laffer curve you're on. At the moment, what we need to do is demonstrate uh, that we have a sound economy and we are operating on sound money principles. Whether that means taking 2% up here or there, or what you do with corporation tax or capital gains and so on, those are treasury matters. What I'm here to do is look at our wider business, uh, our wider business and trade policy. What are we doing on investment? What are we doing to encourage companies to come here? Some of that will be tax, but tax is not the whole story. We talk about tax as if it's a silver bullet that will fix everything. It's not. There's a lot more that needs doing supply side reforms, deregulatory reforms. And when we talk about deregulatory reforms, we don't mean taking away people's rights. We mean making sure that the regulation we have is fit for the economy that we want. A couple of things though. So, so these are obviously, you're gonna get your teeth stuck into them in the coming months, I imagine. But the steel sector, for instance, that is a big part of the job of the business department. Mm -hmm. Do you, is your instinct that come what may, the UK needs to have a steel industry, even if it has to support it in future? Or is that not necessarily a given? Um, nothing, nothing, nothing is ever, nothing is ever a given. It's possible to look at steel from two different angles. You can look at steel from a local industry perspective, that this is something which uh, provides jobs uh, to particular communities and we want it to survive, thrive and grow in the UK. You can look at it in the context of what is happening internationally with China and other players making so much steel that we can't really control the price in the market which means that steel needs uh, subsidies. And you can also look at it from the perspective which I've been looking at it from an international trade in terms of tariffs and uh, WTO trading rules. There's a big, big, bigger picture around steel beyond should we just uh, save this particular company or help this particular community. And that is where working across Whitehall uh, makes a, a real big difference. It is good to now have all of the policies sitting in one department, but I've also just been doing 
the business rule for a day. So I understand it a lot more from the international trade perspective and the multilateral trading system, WTO rules, etc. Now I need to sit down and look at what exactly has been going on with steel uh, from a business perspective and an industry perspective. So specifically one question on trade. Are you, are you happy with the kind of the, the, the range of different trade deals that you've inherited? Because a lot of them you, know, you did inherit. Are you happy with, with, say, New Zealand? Are you happy with Australia? George Eustace said that the best thing about the Australia deal is that you could, is that basically you could throw it out if you wanted to. I mean, is that, mm. do, you, do, you, do you buy that? Um, that is not the best thing about the Australia deal. Uh, the best thing about the Australia deal is it's actually a forward-looking free trade agreement. It is a good deal. It's one of the first ones we've done. So you do, you do like it? I do like it. So certainly uh, from what I've seen going through uh, the trade bill, which we've been taking through Parliament for both Australia and New Zealand. And I think the challenge that we have with deals like Australia and New Zealand, where those are economies that are predominantly, or certainly in a very large way, dominated by agriculture, is that our agricultural sector looks at it from a competitive angle. So I'm an MP for a rural constituency, and I know what farmers are going through, and it's really important that we let farmers know that we have their backs, but we are primarily a services economy. And the trade deals are not just about selling uh, dairy and buying beef and so on and so forth. And I, uh, I think the challenge I would make to people like George Eustace is that we can't keep uh, talking about other countries as if we only want to sell to them and don't want to buy anything that they have got. Trade is something that benefits both parties. It's not a zero-sum game or something where you're taking from, from one party and, and there's a loser. loser. And, that, and that's why I think it's a good deal, because it provides mutual benefit to both countries. Well, I, w w one other kind of question that on, on your new kind of department for growth. If growth is really important, do you th where does net zero fit into that? Is, is, is it still something that is potentially an impediment to growth? Because you've... you've talked about that you've referred to that in the past it, it yes it depends on how you you carry out the policy you can have a net zero policy that generates growth and you can have a net zero policy that bankrupts you and you need to think very carefully about what it is uh, you're putting in place in order to make sure that you have the positive outcome not the negative outcome so my challenge to many people who talk about uh, net zero and growth as if it's just a given is that they need to really think through what they're doing from first principles rather than just uh, you know make, talk about platitudes of green jobs and so on. What are we going to do with this new industrial revolution? Is it going to be like the internet? In which case we need to get in early in some areas, but we also know that there will be winners and losers. I remember the dot-com boom and the time, uh, you know, I remember everybody putting lots of money into companies that ended up going nowhere. So being very careful about what we invest in and make sure that it's something that's going to derive benefits. Being quite hard-nosed looking at business cases is a really key. Um, is really key. Uh, do you think Joe Biden's got the right balance on that? Because, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, it's this enormous piece of legislation in the US. Uh, it's, it's hundreds of billions of dollars. It doesn't feel at the moment, it, first of all, that's a lot of money being mm. spent. It's potentially going to have a big impact here. We can mm -hmm. see that potentially some green investment is going to leak away from here. Do, it doesn't feel like we actually have a strategy or a policy yet on that. I mean, do, do we have a policy on this? We, well, we, we, we are still in a place where the policy from the US is being developed. But what I would say about the Inflation Reduction Act is the protectionism only works if one person does it. If everybody's doing it, then we all become losers. So if the response... So and it's to, protectionist, is it? The well, well I think subsidising... Uh, I've, I've, written, I've written publicly about this, and I've written to uh, my trade counterpart in the US. I've been there uh, multiple times now, spoken to representatives in the government. And they've said, so they've heard what I'm about to say. This, this isn't anything new. But if you subsidize industry to an extent that it damages your allies, it affects supply chains, it creates single points of failure, it actually makes uh, allied countries more vulnerable to those other countries who we do see uh, more threatening as more threatening economically. And what our strategy has been is to try and work with lots of countries who are in the same uh, position that we are, and that includes the EU, but also countries like Japan, countries like South Korea, Switzerland, Australia, New Zealand. These are, many of them are countries that are in CPTPP, but these are countries who are like the UK, they have strong economies, they are very well developed, 
and they have a global outlook in terms of making sure the supply chains are diversified. What does it mean if we all start subsidizing our industries? Some of us will lose money. It won't pay off for others. Who's going to win? Who's going to lose? And there are some people who are better placed than others to take advantage of it. So even within the EU, the EU may speak as one voice, but actually there are some countries who would benefit in the EU from having an Inflation Reduction Act and other EU countries would lose out mm. massively if the EU went down that track. So what our strategy has been is to try and build a coalition of uh, those countries that disagree with this trying to reinforce again World, World Trade Organization, multilateral trading rules, work very well with the uh, Director General there to remind people that there is a better way. We can do this in a way that creates growth for everybody. And we've seen economically that if the growth only happens in one part of the world and the rest of the world uh, doesn't see growth, it still has an impact on us, whether it's on migration, whether it's on security challenges, and um, the willingness of other countries to work with us. And if we are going to have growth in the green sector, whether it's in critical minerals and so on, we need to work with many of those countries who will be, we will be saying, no, we're not interested in your, um, in your industry, but we want to take your, your minerals. It just, just doesn't work like that. But meanwhile, a lot, of, a lot of potential green jobs look like they're leaking out of this country. Nope, I don't think that is true, certainly not at this point. And also, we are uh, not as exposed, because of the nature of our industry, uh, we're not as exposed as, say, the, the EU is. Uh, We've had some good news from the US in terms of the way that they will interpret their rules. So some of this can be fixed with guidance. But the truth is we have to look very carefully at what we are willing to do. Are we, as you mentioned, Steele earlier, are we going to subsidize every single thing? We're talking about a planned economy effectively if we take all of this down to... So your um, instincts are very much not about subsidising... Um, su su subsidies are appropriate in certain cir circumstances. So it means going back to first principles. On what basis are we subsidising? What are we going to subsidise? What are we not going to subsidise? Rather than everybody wants a subsidy, mm. let's subsidise it all and hope it all works out. That is not a strategy. And that's certainly not what well, we're that, doing. But, but Biden, you know, the White House would say they've got a strategy here. They're subsidising certain kind of, you know, dirty industries to become mm. cleaner. And they're mm -hmm. subsidising certain kind of clean methods of generating power. Is that not a reasonable kind of path for us to well, potentially take? Well, it, it is. But then look at the 10-point plan. I remember when I was in the Treasury, we had the 10-point plan and we gave a pathway for what we wanted to do in order to, um, in order to deliver net zero. A lot of that work is already happening. Some of it is around legislative certainty, uh, what we've talked about with electric vehicles and so on. Some of it is around developing hydrogen, carbon capture storage. Where we are um, in terms of geography is very helpful for many of these technologies. So there is a strategy there. But what we can't but again, do... All the, they're, they're all covered by the Inflation Reduction Act as so, well. So a lot of those industries are now thinking, Ooh, it's, maybe it's, it'd be better to be in the US. So, well, then the logical conclusion of what you're saying is that every, com every bit business is going to go to the US and set up shop there unless every country subsidizes when every country can't afford to do that. That is not a sustainable position. That's not quite the logical conclusion. It, I, said, I think it is. I think, well, well, well the, I think it is. The US is, at the so moment are subsidizing a lot and, and we're, we're, we're not. I suppose the question is whether that's just a red line. You wouldn't, you wouldn't potentially it's not, subsidize. It's, it's not something, well, I'm not going to make the policy um, in an interview. Like I said, I've been doing the job for one day. This is how I've been looking at it from an international trade perspective in terms of partnering with, with other countries. Now that I'm business secretary, I can go away and look at what our strategy should be uh, in, well, first of all, on, on its own terms, and then after that, in relation to what other countries are doing. But we are a leader in many areas. We can't always just look at what America is doing and say, well, America is doing this, so let's do the same thing. That is not strategic thinking. What you're describing is just copying and pasting. That's not a strategy. Okay, that's interesting. And, and I mean, just finally, looking at the, the state of the economy as it currently is, mm. looking at the, the level of kind of taxes and spending that we have, you said you're not very happy, you know, you, you, you're, it's the right thing at the moment for kind of sound money. Mm -hmm. Your instinct, I presume, is to try to get those levels down. Of course, that was the same instinct that was held by Liz Truss. Mm. She's been talking quite a lot recently. What, do you have any kind of reflections about that period in government, what, whether, you know, what the mistakes that were made were? And well, if you listen to what I was saying in the summer, I was saying that tax cuts, you know, I wasn't going to get into a race on tax cuts. Tax cuts are not a silver bullet. You can't start from there in terms of creating an economic strategy. What we need to do is something more fundamental, is look at how government works, what the state is doing. 
are we spending uh, on the right public services? Are we doing so in the right way? Certain things aren't working anymore. And this is, uh, this is exemplified by what the Prime Minister has just done uh, yesterday in terms of talking about science innovation uh, as being areas where we as a country do so well in specialising. Let's have a ministry that's looking at that. Let's have a department that's really focused on those policies because we think that that's where we can make outsized gains. So just starting with tax as a single lever, which you move up and down, can have adverse consequences. But I am somebody who does believe in low and simple taxes. But in order to get there, you need to create an environment that allows that to happen. Simply starting with the taxes when there's lots of stuff to do in terms of you know, fiscal and monetary policy uh, more broadly is just not, it's, it's not where I would start. Okay. Kelly Badenoch, thank you very much. Minister of, uh, Secretary of State for Business, Trade, but also the Secretary of State for Growth. Mm. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>